We're going to get straight on with the afternoon session, which is about volunteers and the big society, whatever that is. Uh, and we're kicking off with George Munger of Conservation and Museum Services. George, over to you. Thank you, Simon. Um, right, before Big Dave has his great idea about the big society, museums were full of volunteers, so they still are, and there's a lot of volunteer-run museums who do some fantastic work. In 2001, I published an article in Museums Journal about uh, <coughs> some work I'd done developing volunteer groups, and uh, these groups were do doing remedial conservation, and I did get a certain amount of criticism about this, um, working with volunteers in this way. <coughs> um, one of the criticisms was the idea of how do they make decisions. A very important thing. Um, I'll come to that in a little while, uh, but uh, I thought it was a little bit patronising, you know, that people, these people can't make decisions. If, um, but one of the things about working with volunteers, a key thing, is, is, is training. And it's not just the initial training, but it's how the training is followed up and continued um, <clears throat> and how effective it is and what you do in the training as well. I've had some quite bad uh, uh, things with, with volunteers over the years, uh, several problems like uh, volunteers coming in and um, wanting to do what they want to do and... Uh, one of the problems was, well, one particular volunteer was a friend of a trustee or a relative of a trustee who just wanted to come in and paint the farm equipment black. Um, I didn't want him to do it. I got into trouble for telling him so. Um, another example was I advised a group of volunteers. They were cleaning, knocking rust off um, blacksmith tools. And I told them what to do and what to put on. Um, it all... They, fo they seemed to follow my instructions, but not quite properly. So all the tools started rusting again, and they didn't know why. Um, it was basically because they weren't doing what I told them. It was as simple as that. Um, <clears throat> another bad volunteer encounter was um, at a training day I, I gave some chap at a volunteer-run museum. He had some bronzes with some bronze disease, and they... He asked me my advice, and uh, I said, well, I poss couldn't possibly give you advice without seeing them. And he asked how much it would cost to do, and I gave a, a figure off the top of my head. Uh, a few months later, I was at a <coughs> another training day, and he was there, and he came up to me quite triumphant, actually, that he had these bronzes done for free. His brother-in-law did them, and the... Treatments seem to be, include boiling them in oil of some description. I'm not really sure because I lost interest a, a, a bit. So what these sorts of encounters have, have told me is that <coughs> when you're working with volunteers and developing volunteers, you've got really four things to bear in mind. First, you've got to find the right people. Um, <coughs> secondly, and this is linked to the first one, is, is the training, the training. The training of the group, you have to try and give them some idea of what we're actually trying to do in conservation, what it's about. Teach them a little bit of the ethics. We can't teach them everything, but it is trying to teach them why we do things, what we're trying to do in conservation. Um, the, the other thing was that it's important to continue to work with them as long as possible, because if you work alongside and help people make the decisions, um, it actually develops them a lot better, but it also makes them more circumspect, I find, anyway. They, they don't dash into things and do uh, like a bull in the china shop. They'll actually stand back, and quite often, if your training's been good, good enough, they will also <coughs> um, realise what they can't do and will often pull back from uh, doing something that they've no, no knowledge of. Um, <clears throat> one of the concerns I do have as a freelance, when I've gone in to develop a, a group, there comes a point when uh, 
the money runs out and I have to pull out. Um, and then I, you know, I have to worry, do they carry on? How, how do they carry on? And are they making the right decisions later on? Um, I just want to give you three examples of, uh, if I've got time, groups I've worked with. <coughs> um, I was commissioned by the Greenfield Valley Museum and Heritage Park, uh, North Wales, to develop and supervise a volunteer group to conserve, and that was important, conserve the last remaining Jones Combine Harvester. In developing the group, we had a training day, we got people together, and in that training day, we actually managed to weed out the people who we didn't want. Um, there was one guy who was a complete enthusiast, he wanted to do it up and have it running and cutting corn and all the rest of it. Um, <coughs> That training was crucial to the way they continued with the work, but it was also cr crucial to finding the right people to do the job. Um, <coughs> another example, just one more example, was at the Cotswold Heritage uh, Centre in North Leach. I trained a volunteer group, and they had a curator did the training with them, because the idea was that I would continue, I'd go every fortnight and work with them, and... <coughs> um, troubleshoot and everything. This curator did the training day with, with me as well. And they had, when I wasn't there, they had a question. And they said to the curator, what should we do? And he gave them an answer. And they looked at him for a little while. And they said, we'll wait till George comes next week. So it made me think my training had them thinking and holding back, which is a, quite a crucial thing. Um, Uh, just a point, we worry about using volunteers in doing uh, some of this conservation work, but there is an issue that sometimes this collection care work, this conservation work, would actually not happen if it wasn't a volunteer group being instructed and um, helped through this work. Okay, I've got the red light. Hooray. <laughs> Thank you very much, George. Obviously an advocate uh, for volunteers there, so I'm going to ask Katie to respond. Thank you, Simon. Um, I'm afraid I can't be any person who disagrees because the National Trust relies on 13.2 million volunteers to open our houses to the public and also to achieve some of the conservation. So the kind of model of managing volunteers that, uh, George, you portrayed is really one to which I think um, we would... Aspire. I think the issues that arise where things go wrong are where projects have been poorly framed and set up and where the expectations of both sides are not properly managed. And I think there sometimes can be an issue that we could sort of... It's a question of sort of respect for other people, not only um, of the conservator for the volunteer, but of the volunteer for the conservators, of respect between people that not one side should choose to go in and um, try and dominate uh, try, try and dominate the other. And the way to manage that is by having a clear set of objectives and protocols to which each side has to subscribe, and that if those people don't choose to abide by that, then they get moved on in as nice and polite a way as possible so that we maintain their support forevermore and they leave us lots of money in their wills. So um, <laughs> I don't really... I was just kind of wondering, is there, uh, for you, an ethical issue in the use of volunteers? The, there is an ethical issue, but um, with the vol sort of work that I've been doing with volunteers, it's been mainly on th things like um, agricultural equipment. Um, uh, you know, sort of, there's actually not a lot of harm that uh, a volunteer could do to a, a ransom's plough. Um, it's when maybe they go on to other things that you might get some ethical issues. But what I hope, when I do, do the training, I, I hope to try and get over some of the um, conservation ethics and the mindset, what we're doing, why we're doing it. <coughs> and that, that, I feel, tends to... Um, 
make them hold back rather than go in and do lots of interventive stuff. Um, I f in a lot of cases, a lot of these things, people are often going to try and do it anyway. Um, especially in, the, in volunteer museums, they're going to try and do it anyway because they can't afford our fees, um, to put it bluntly, um, or they won't afford our fees. Um, so, I, I, you know, my balance is if I can get them thinking in the right way and getting advice, at least, that's better than them going ahead and... Uh, you know, sort of you, using something that they've seen, you know, sort of, sort of, that they've seen down the hardware shop and slapping it on. Okay, George, does I think Katie wants to yes. come back. At, yeah, so just yeah. before you open it up to mm -hmm. the floor, Simon, I, th I think that kind of raises the interesting possibility to me that in the terms of the framework under which you might work with volunteers, is there something around a framework of ethics for volunteers? who work in conservation mm -hmm. that one would expect them to subscribe to beyond the particular project that they might be engaged in with George's supervision, mm -hmm. that they would take responsibility for enacting if they moved on to other projects. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank can you. I, can I just Please, yeah. add something? I <coughs> Obviously, conservation records were important. I actually, when I work with a volunteer group or with a volunteer museum, I actually produce a conservation record which includes not only the, the uh, condition of the object what needs to be done but I uh, try and get sort of signatures of agreement of what's to be done um, and with the caveat that if, if they want to veer away from what has been agreed it's a matter of discussion with the curator or whoever owns the object mm -hmm. so it's trying to sort of develop a framework that they, they work within. But it, Sorry. Uh, an issue arises for me with the use of volunteers <laughs> as opposed to people working professionally. Professionally, if you are accredited or you're qualified as conservator, you are signing up to, to a code of conduct or, or a set of ethics. And simply, do vol are volunteers subject to the same set of ethics? Because surely we're giving them a few hours training and letting them get on with it. Um, how does that fit with our overall approach to the care of uh, the heritage? So, any responses from the floor to George? We've got one on the left there. So, um, Sarah Paul, come on. Um, I think with a framework of ethics, and if we're going to construct that, then it's up to us to install that in the volunteers because we are going to be the trainers. And here in Wales, obviously, um, I work for Carmel Museums, Archives Libraries Wales, and we have um, a training programme. So all the museums, and there's a lot of volunteer run museums in Wales um, that quite come to us for help, and we provide that. And I think it's always as well kind of installing them the first principle. It's that first do no harm. And whenever I do training, it's always like if you're, in, if you're ever in doubt, you just stop. And you, it is, again, establishing the networks, the support networks. They know who to go to for help and adv advice. I think it's thinking about the bigger picture as well and more longer term and thinking about, you know, what support networks we can provide so that they're not in a position then where they're at the end of a project thinking, ah, what do I need to do next? Because it's up to us then to kind of create that framework, framework and kind of so that they continue with it as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're echoing fundamentally what George has already said, that yeah. you endorse that approach. Okay, so thank I, you. I, I do think it wrong that uh, area museum services, things like that, will, or they used to put on conservation training days and it's one day, and mm -hmm. the conservator goes in, gives training, and that's it. Mm -hmm. That's no good. Okay. We've well, got Jane, do you want to make a point here? Oh. Oh. Sorry. Chris, Chris oh, sorry, Chris, yes, at the back yeah. there. And Bob. Hello. Um, just making a point, uh, more responding to Simon's comment about do you give volunteers a couple of hours training and then let them loose? Uh, at Duxford, we have anywhere between 60 and 100 volunteers in the conservation department at any given time. We were up to 200 at one point, got a bit crazy. But my volunteers do not make mistakes. My member of staff might have given the wrong volunteer the wrong job or the wrong training or the wrong supervision, but it's the member of staff, the conservator, that's got to answer to me if, there's, if something's been damaged, not the volunteer. And we find that system works for us. 
and every volunteer reports to a member of staff. Okay, we have an, uh, another comment here, George, uh, on top. Sorry. Bob Child, there is a very strong point that conservators shouldn't make ethical judgments. Would you care to? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Jane. I just wanted to challenge the idea that um, if I didn't show them how to do it, they would do a worse job of it. I completely understand and sympathise with the intent behind that, but I think in terms of constructing an ethical code to say, well, I attempted the surgery because the other person was blind, and okay, I'm just a carpenter. Um, but I don't think we can say that this is an approach in which to, to construct an understanding. So I would, I would like to challenge that. And I'm sure we will. You go ahead, Bob. <laughs> in many circumstances, whose viewpoint is better, the member of the general public or the conservator? Mm -hmm. Whose story? Mm. Whose story, who decides? And we, we will come back to that, I'm sure. Anyway, that's, thank you very much, George. We need to move on to the next speaker. Our next speaker...